Okay, very welcome everyone to this Seedbox lecture, which is part of the Scholars and Artists Residences program within the larger Seedbox program. Uh, an important part, I should add. Uh, and I'm extremely happy and honored uh, to welcome here today our guest, uh, Professor Serpil Opperman, who spends the month of October here at the Seedbox program at Linköping University. And Serpil is professor um, of environmental humanities at Cappadocia University in Turkey and has served on many boards and committees uh, pertaining to the field of environmental humanities. And I would like to mention just a few. She was the president of the European Association for the Study of Literature, Culture and Environment between 2016 and 2018. And that's this year. Yeah, it's just finished, yeah. And she is also a member of the Seedbox Advisory Board, for instance. Uh, she is the ambassador of Turkey at SLSA EU, European Society for Literature, Science and the Arts. And she's also a member of the Advisory Council uh, of METI, which is a really interesting organization, I think. Yeah, fascinating uh, uh, council. Uh, uh, the messaging extraterrestrial intelligence <laughs> uh, uh, group, which is based in San Francisco, California. Uh, surely a fascinating uh, thing. Uh, among Serpil's most recent publications, one can mention, uh, and these are anthologies, I think, all, New International Voices in Ecocriticism from 2015, Material Ecocriticism, which is also the subject of our talk today, I think, uh, from 2014, and uh, Environmental Humanities, Voices from the Anthropocene, uh, which came out in 2017, when which she edited together with Serenella Jovino and, uh, yeah, with Serenella Jovino. Yeah, that's true. You were the two of you. Uh, and coming originally from the field of literature and complete, there's a certain logic behind the title of your talk today. Uh, which is, or your lecture, as you say, uh, which is Sites of Narrativity. And we all very much look forward to an excavation of these sites. Uh, so please, Serpil, warmly welcome. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for your warm welcome. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to express my deep feeling of gratitude to all of you for, in the seed box, actually, for inviting me and welcoming me to this prestigious site. I've been very happy to be part of the uh, program here. But I especially thank Professor Jesper Olsen uh, for inviting me to give this talk here. It is for me a great pleasure and actually a great honor to be here. Um, as you can guess uh, from, from the title, uh, the topic of this talk is uh, material ecocriticism, which claims that the world we inhabit is in various senses alive and has an expressive dimension. And I mean really alive um, in a real sense as a physiological truth, not philosophically. Uh, in this account, Living matter is a site of narrativity, a site of creative becomings and dynamic expressions. The stories of matter are actually everywhere, in the air we breathe, in the food we eat, in the things and beings of this world, beyond and within us. Um, and therefore, uh, material ecocriticism views matter in terms of its agentic expressions, inherent creativity, and innate meanings. We see the world as uh, a living text impressed with many stories of ecological and existential relationships. Um, material ecocritism basically proposes two ways of interpreting this expressive uh, reality or expressive materiality, if you like. The first way focuses on matter's own narrative power of creating configurations of meanings. And the second one focuses on how matter's agentic capacities are represented in fictional and cultural narratives. Here, material agencies appear with an ability to express themselves, to construct a storied experience of the world. 
in the first case, matter becomes a site of narrativity, where dynamics of an expressive non-human agency, both biotic and a, a, abiotic, is inscribed and produced. In the second, literature plays a crucial role, actually a key role, in cons constructing these dynamics uh, through literary and cultural representations of matter's creative and expressive capacities. Uh, material ecocriticism uh, envisions nature's constituents, geological formations, elements, invisible agents, bodies, and impersonal objects, all, all of them as narrative agencies. Understanding this reality is understanding the agencies at work in the world's entangled phenomena. Emerging in social and natural environments, these agencies produce signifying forces. All that happens in the micro as well as in the macro realms of reality happens in and through bodies interlocking humans with non-humans in material semiotic networks. The close study of these networks has triggered an unprecedented attention to matter in the environmental debates. At the very heart of this debate, uh, as Diana Kuhl and Samantha uh, Frost, note, is nothing than uh, a challenge to some of the most basic assumptions that have underpinned the modern world, including its normative sense of the human and its beliefs about human agency, but also regarding its material practices, such as the ways we labor on, exploit, and interact with nature." End quote. Now, the first of these most basic assumptions is the chasm between the human and the non-human worlds in terms of agency uh, and, of course, uh, communication. Compared to a human endowed with agentic consciousness and intentionality, the material world, a world which also includes in so-called inanimate matter as well as all non-human forms of living, has always been considered passive, inert, and unable to convey any meaningful expression. Such a vision, however, has determined a whole series of intersectional oppressions based on species, race, gender, but also on much more radical ontological divisions. To overlook the fact that we all dwell in a world crisscrossed by, by non-human agencies, which combine and collide with human spheres, leads not only to a very partial of vision of reality, but also to the discourses about the living world that are insufficient if, if separated from its broader material substratum. Therefore, the, the new materialists um, advocate a less exclusive, less human-centered concept of agency, one that is not circumscribed by the prerogative human cognitive faculties that generate agentic capacity. Agency now implies a fold in which human, all the humans and um, everywhere, and non-humans, all of them, are materially tied together. Expressed lyrically with a vision of either harmonious choreography of human and non-human natures in creative materiality or active creativity, as David Abram uh, articulates it, we are born of these waters, he says. This very air, this loamy soil, this sunlight, or in terms of dangerous chemical agents inhabiting our bodies and others, this fold is what determines this composite, the composite reality of this world. It is visible, especially in the transcorporeal interchanges of various bodily natures. Now, this recognition entails a new understanding of bodies, environments, and natures as sites replete with potent power that pull the allegedly separate human back into the collective life cycle. The animate earth, in other words, deconstructs our binary categories and directs attention to a deeply intertwined web of human and non-human agents. Whether it appears in species extinction, climate patterns, or the practices of extraction and consumption of natural sources, this web, in this particular uh, perspective, material ecocritical perspective, involves segments of a conversation between human and non-human subjects. 
central to this understanding is the fact that the real dimension of the world's phenomena lies in the concrete links between life and language, mind and sensorial perception, allowing the outside to merge with the inside, the mind with the world. And it is in this mesh that matter mutually determines cognitions, social constructions, scientific practices, and also ethical attitudes. And matter is, in Donna Haraway's words, always semiotically active. Uh, it, and it has an expressive force that endures far longer than ourselves and our stories. This point that materiality is never semiotically inert and therefore inseparable from the field of signification is crucial in understanding material ecocriticism. Uh, actually, biosemiotics is the driving force behind, behind this view uh, with a distinctive focus on biotic systems engaged in sign relations and their interpretations. Uh, there are many signs, actually, through which the natural world expresses its, its mind. If we consider the structural relations between organisms and uh, the environment, we find communication uh, everywhere, ranging from genes to cells, from electrons to bacteria, and uh, in a more uh, familiar sense, from flora to fauna. Haraway defines this as a material semiotic means of relating. Bacteria, for example, uh, communicate within and between species using uh, quorum sensing language. These are signaling molecules used for communication. Like human nerve cells, bacteria can talk to each other using electrical signals in the form of potassium ions in order to coordinate their actions, which material ecocriticism interprets as a form of narrativity. Uh, quorum sensing allows bacteria to monitor their environment, to detect the presence of other bacteria, and respond to changes occurring in the community. Uh, the little figures, the fellows you see here, this is, uh, of course, not my doing. I have uh, borrowed it from uh, Sahana's The Bacterial Talk, um, the Department of Biosciences and Technology. Material ecocriticism, however, goes beyond the biotic world claiming that matter's eloquence is not limited to meaningful communication among uh, living organisms. Chemical substances circulating in the biosphere or plastic bags invading our oceans are as expressive as bacteria and, and more complex organisms like plants and animals. Even lifeless entities like electrons can be said to have a certain degree of uh, experience when they um, communicate non-locally. Uh, this is principally the narrative revelation of a storied world where all beings, again in uh, David Abrams' words, have the ability to communicate something of, of themselves to other beings. This world is seen as a site of narrativity in material ecocriticism, a site where, where narrative agencies, whether biotic or not, assemble and disseminate meaningful expressions. I will give you a striking example from inorganic uh, matter that defies our definition of being alive. It comes from the research project at uh, the University of Glasgow aimed to create life from carbon-free inorganic chemicals, which uh, the researchers called uh, iCell. Uh, these are inorganic chemical cells. Similar to carbon-based cells, as you can see here, iCell and human cell, they resemble each other. Uh, so it's almost impossible to detect the difference here. So similar to carbon-based cells, these chemical compounds self-replicate and evolve in their environment. iCells act like living cells, and their story is the story of matter as a dynamic be becoming reconfiguring our foundational notions of agency, matter, and more uh, essentially life. What is our definition of life? So far, uh, it's been you know, grounded in um, organic uh, re replication processes, but now inorganic matter is able to uh, enact the same process.
interesting. As Daniel, uh, uh, excuse me, as Manuel uh, De Landa would say, uh, these entities, they don't have genes. They don't have anything that tells them what to do. Yet, they act as if they are metabolically active, generating disquieting meanings about our future, end quote. In this sense, matter in every form is a meaning-producing embodiment of the world. All agentic acti uh, entities have the ability to communicate intelligibly with other entities and produce meaning-filled encounters with everything else around them. Meaning, as Karen Barad uh, defines it, is, uh, in her words, an ongoing performance of the world in its differential intelligibility, in which our cognitive practices also participate. Intelligibility, Barad also claims, is an ontological performance of the world in its ongoing articulation. It is this idea, actually, uh, that enabled us uh, to conceptualize matter as storied. For story to exist, it must always be framed by some sort of articulation, performance, and or intelligibility. Uh, talking of storied matter, then, means to recognize patterns of signification in the agency of things, in bodies, in material phenomena. It means to analyze the things around us and within us as parts of a dense tissue of stories. It means to see the network of agencies as expressive forces and to see our story as co-evolving with the stories of matter. It also means to see the world as a st storehouse of inexhaustible records of evolutionary histories in which everything is an extension of matter's creative expressions. All matter, in other words, is a molecular library of Earth's evolution, which is deeply interlaced with human mindscapes, reflexivity, and imagination. Uh, again, David Abram says, all things have the capacity of speech. Then, if this, this is the case, then there must be a creative materiality around us with a tendency to be a narrative agency, dance with stories, as Little Mouse here that I picked would be saying. <laughs> narrative agency, um, I would define it uh, as a non-linguistic performance inherent in every material formation from bodies to their atoms, making them telling or storied. Narrative agencies are actually building blocks of storied matter with undeniable signifying uh, forces. So whether it is a cell, a singing whale, a whispering wind, a pebble on the beach, an erupting volcano, a hurricane, or a plastic bag, matter is encoded with meaningful narratives through which the world becomes eloquent. Non-human narratives emerge through, uh, through signs, but also through sounds and colors and gestures that we as material eco-critics interpret as stories. These stories come to matter in the form of evolutionary histories, climactic narratives, biological memories, geological records, species tragedies, um, even DNA uh, poetics, you can say, or uh, in a more familiar form, uh, human literatures. When depicted uh, uh, with the human mind or deciphered, they reveal tales of resilience. But it's not, they don't always, I will talk about that, they don't always uh, depend on a human mind to be deciphered. They don't need a human mind to decipher them or interpreting them. But I'll talk about it a bit later. So we can say now and decipher it. Uh, however, they reveal tales of resilience, evolution and dissolution, and its extinctions and survivals. Uh, I'll give you some examples, like squids. They tell today tragic stories of their diminished ability to survive amidst increasing ocean acidity. Fossils, another example. Fossils tell stories of extinct beings captured in time. Volcanoes tell stories about the Earth's turbulent past. Tree rings yield stories of long years of droughts and rains and glaciers transmit stories of changing ecosystems and global warming. The soil, 
tells a distressing story today about excess amounts of nitrous oxides dripping into the underground aquifers and reaching up to the clouds, accelerating the erosion of the ozone layer. Apparently, their stories emerge through humans who impress meaning upon matter. But as Jane Bennett reminds us, not entirely because of humans or because of us. Jeffrey Cohen also argues that matter's stories come to life through humans, but at the same time, humans themselves emerge through material agencies that leave their traces in lives as well as stories. Storied matter, then, whether perceived or interpreted by the human mind or not, is, again, I quote from Jeffrey Cohen, is thick with surprising narratives, some vivid, some barely legible, others impossible to translate, end quote. Um, let's take a stone, which is which just like um, a, f a fossil fragment, impressed with the memories of uh, times um, immemorial, bears witness to the primordial past of this planet. The stone is carved with memories of geological evolution that are not in place there by any human agency. But its transformative meanings can be as cultural as they are geological. Not surprisingly, uh, geologists often talk about geological records holding stories of dynamic fusions with animals, plants, and humans. In fact, everything that, that we can see, hear, and touch, and also interact with, is storied. And our story always commingles with the stories of geological forces and atmospheric patterns, also with disappearing species and toxic substances. We all share a space that is as much a semiotic sphere as it is material in producing meanings and um, narratives. Today, however, stories of matter are profoundly troubling, like the traumatic tales of plastic uh, choked birds, uh, excuse me, plastic choked birds on Midway Island in the North Pacific Ocean. As you can see, this is, uh, these uh, images are taken from Chris Jordan's uh, documentary called Midway. Like T.S. Eliot's river that sweats oil and tar, the island here sweats dying albatrosses. These plastic objects are narrative agencies in material ecocriticism. They demonstrate the slow death of so many marine species. Do we have the courage to face the realities of our time? Asks Chris Jordan in his documentary, inviting the audience to a journey, I quote, across an ocean of grief. Marked by an explosion of material vitality, literally colored by the countless plastic objects and by a shocking recognition, the images of the dead albatross confront the challenge, confront the challenge of dissolution when the agency of manufactured substances dominate the ecosystems. In this film, the ocean of grief is caused by this petroleum species manufactured by greedy human petrocultures. Therefore, their agentic power becomes alarmingly disquieting when it is shown interacting recursively with the ocean oceanic environment, colonizing it relentlessly like an unstoppable virus. Since narrative agencies emerge through their interchanges with human reality, their stories can indeed help us better understand fragile ecosystems, polluted landscapes, carbon-filled atmosphere, as acidifying oceans, changing climate, species extinction, and countless social crises. Through these stories, we come to know the unheard voices of the Earth, which have today become quite disenchanted with catastrophic human practices. Thinking about storied matter in a disenchanted world means thinking seriously about how our invasive uh, economic practices produce planetary cycles of pollution and how our political decisions and cultural meanings are enmeshed in their production. Therefore, as Serenella Iovino uh, has put it, to read the world as a text is a necessary way to create social forms of cognitive justice and hence practices of political liberation and environmental responsiveness. 
However, she continues, whenever the text of the world is misread, uncontrollable consequences ensure, ensue. And it happens all the time we set up an alienated relationship to reality. End quote. Explained scientifically, in the words of quantum physicist David Bohm, my favorite physicist, I quote, our action toward the whole universe is a result of what it means to us and that the rest of the universe acts signosomatically to us according to what we mean to it. Uh, that means every meaning at a certain level is affecting the body at a more manifest level. So matter, in other words, uh, is influenced by our interpretations and reacts accordingly. Thus understood, storied matter is not just a conceptualization. It's not a poetic fancy. Uh, it's not something abstract we came up with. It represents a new ecology of understanding a meaningfully articulate planet. If we read the world this way, a storied materiality that binds all beings, forces, and substances with interconnected stories, we can impart new ideas and insights about our experiences and perceptions of the planet. So, endorsing the vitality of things and their creative expressions in the storied world, uh, material ecocriticism encourages us to embrace life, language, mind, and our sensorial per perceptions in a non-dualistic uh, perspective, or in this anthropocentric pers pers perspectives. Engaging in these disanthropocentric conversations with the non-human realities also entails a critical self-reflection on our part as humans, on our moral accountability, because entangled relations are as conflictual as they are constitutive in producing social facts that always overlap with environmental processes. Material ecocriticism sees all these entangled relations as texts bearing material stories, stories of creativity, as well as stories of destruction that are both cultural and ecological. Anyone who reads these stories will find how intimately linked are flows of food, money, energy, toxicity, health, power, relations, political intentions, uh, species extinctions, climate change, and the planet's skin and wounds, along with bodies, symbols, imagination, and physical forces. Considering agency as an expressive property of matter in its material semiotic relations, material ecocriticism opens up an interpretive horizon to make storied matter part of our story storytelling culture. Hence, giving um, matter access uh, to articulation by way of stories that co-emerge with the human is not only um, a way to emancipate matter from its silence and passivity, but also to liberate ourselves from the images, discourses, and practices of our Cartesian mindset. Therefore, reflecting on storied matter also means reflecting on the interconnections between reality and language, power and knowledge, and life and death. There, uh, these are actually some of the themes literature articulates producing narratives of matter in cultural discourses. Literary language opens up the vitality inherent in matter and extends it over time. Uh, the most uh, self-evident sites of narrativity uh, are obviously literary texts. Like the stories of matter, literary texts or literary stories emerge from the interaction of human creativity and the narrative agencies of matter. In this co-emergence, literature can be said to amplify reality itself, also affecting our cognitive responses to this reality as embodied creatures of both the world and the word. Catherine Hales expresses it better. Literature, she says, is a way of understanding ourselves as embodied creatures living within and through embodied worlds and embodied words. Uh, literature, then, uh, we can say, plays a key role in uh, environmental imagination and has a liberating effect of moving the human vision 
from the language of otherness to that of differential co-emergence. That means our stories are never disconnected from the stories of matter. This is actually the grounding assumption at the birth of eco-criticism itself. Uh, that is, literature cannot be separate from the material world and its ecological dynamics. In her memorable introduction um, to the eco-criticism reader, the first collection on eco-criticism in, in 1996, Cheryl Glotfelty wrote that literature does not float about, um, above the material world in some um, aesthetic ether, but rather plays a part in an immensely complex global system in which energy, matter, and ideas interact. Fictional representations of storied matter um, can be found in every tradition, uh, in every literary tradition. Literary authors, uh, ancient and modern, seem to have been aware of um, this storied matter and narrative agencies, even if they had no um, such label uh, for this. Um, literary critics, however, refer to effective, active, expressive narrative agencies in such texts as personifications of objects <laughs> and things, or uh, in more philosophical terms as anthropomorphism. But as we shall see, it is more complicated uh, than that, although the role played by anthropomorphism is important, yet not in the sense of creating categorical divides or hierarchical vision. Rather, anthropomorphism is strategically used to emphasize the agentic expressiveness of matter. As uh, Jane Bennett notes, I quote, a touch of anthropomorphism, she says, can catalyze a sensibility that finds a world filled with variously composed materialities. Now, these lines um, resonate in, a surpri in surprising ways with the following depiction of material agencies invested with expressive creativity. I I'm now uh, going to give you literary examples. Uh, first come two novels. One is a Turkish novel, and the second is a British novel, a met metafiction. And then I will end this talk uh, by referring to some forgotten 18th century novels in which things and objects speak. So my first example is um, from uh, Bouquet Uzuner. Uh, her novel is, is, is Istanbul. She's an eco-feminist uh, writer. Um, this novel reveals the expressive magic of Istanbul as a non-human entity anthropomorphized in order to catalyze, uh, catalyze an ecological sensibility. It opens with Istanbul's voice. I am Istanbul, city of cities, mistress of metropolises, community of poets, seats of emperors, favorite of sultans, pearl of the world, says Istanbul. And then it continues. Blue as hope, green as poison, rosy as dawn. I am Istanbul, I am in the Judas tree, in the Acacia, in lavender. I am turquoise, I am the unfathomable, the muse of possibility, vitality, creativity. So displaying creativity, and imagination, Istanbul here emerges as a site of narrativity, an articulate entity enmeshed in stories and multiple histories of its human and non-human companions, companions across many time zones. Uh, again, the voice of Istanbul uh, here continues, I am Istanbul, I shall remain forever on the shores of the Bosphorus, represents this, represents an ontology in which the material world is alive with agentic capacity. Istanbul attunes to the rhythms of its own reality, which is both allegoric and telluric. It smells of lavender, of Judas, of acacia and tulip. Istanbul is also a porous body through which flows of other entities pass. Uh, and this demonstrates an entanglement of nature and culture, identity and politics, and ethics and aesthetics that traverse across time and space. Uh, Istanbul says, I have seen them rise and fall, be born and decline. I harbor their jumbled relics in my underground cisterns and valves. I am pain and poetry, for I am the smell of earth, the tang of sea, the stuff of dreams. I am Istanbul, city of magic, city of enchantment, object of the world's desire. Composing and being composed of dreams, desires, sounds, pain, and memories, Istanbul is a typical site of narrativity, embodying not only its own its narratives, uh, but uh, also the narratives of its 
human and non-human inhabitants in the human minds as well as in, their, uh, in, the, in the minds of uh, the non-humans who pass through um, the city. Um, focusing on Istanbul's international uh, Atatürk airport, described as a giant metal whale, Uzuner depicts the city as a narrative site where the characters' stories also bear witness to the boundaries, copious boundaries actually, between human and more than human world. These boundaries are deliberately hybridized in order to foster the narrativity of storied tulips, Judas trees, and lavender, which define the city, resulting in uh, lavender prose. The writer uh, calls her prose lavender prose. And also in dreams and disasters immersed in lavender scents. Uh, and of the storied uh, stone, uh, stones, which are living things, uh, for the character Ihan, who's the, one of the major characters, uh, who's a sculptor waiting at the airport uh, for his beloved uh, Belgian, who's a geneticist uh, arriving from New York. And uh, Ihan says, con referring to the stones, um, I stroke them, cherish them, lay bare their beauty, even hear them. Each piece of stone conceals a jewel, each has its own story and history, each is unique, like people. In this compendium of co-emerging agencies where stone uh, possesses its own life, as Jeffrey Cohen would say, it is difficult to draw a line, as Ihan says, between the living and the non-living. Um, in, these, in, in the examples of stones and lavender, Istanbul's non-human entities prompt the humans to expand their understanding of life beyond their limited visions. Um, for Belgian, Istanbul is uh, like a Judas tree. But for, for her grandmother, Istanbul was most certainly a tulip. Istanbul is famous for its uh, tulips in, uh, that bloom up in... Um, March? No. Oh my God. <laughs> April, April. <laughs> uh, why do you, and the tulip is also uh, a national symbol because we had a tulip age in the 18th century. Tulips have also dethroned the sultan. See their agentic capacity? They have the power. Uh, so uh, Belgian says, why do you think Ottoman seals incorporated the tulip? Uh, then Istanbul speaks, mortals come and go, uh, but I have been here for thousands of years. I am Istanbul, and towards my embrace have rushed emperors and slaves, sultans and laborers, soldiers and philosophers, and through me courses the waters of Bosphorus, and crowning me are my seven hills. Now, what is at issue here is not some fabulative process by which the city is anthropomorphized for promoting a specific aesthetic vision, not at all but to stretch narrative towards the domains of other than human subjects. This is what makes Istanbul exemplary of narrative agency that pushes through the boundaries of textuality and reality. So literary texts like this want us to recognize what Jeffrey Cohen calls narrative companionship between human and non-human agencies and do so often in relation to the premise that narrative agencies have the capacity to astonish us, in his words, with story-filled encounters with uh, the inhuman. What we learn through such texts is what is not metabolically active can also have storylines that can connect ecological and social realms. They also convey a dynamic field where meanings are produced and performed through the blending voices of human and non-human subjects. Another novel that epitomizes narrative agencies is uh, British writer Stephen Hall's captivating Metafiction. It's called the raw shark texts, uh, with its material textual landscape comprised of scanned newspaper clippings, photography, a film still, and typographic images of an eponymous shark who feeds on human memories. The protagonist, Eric Sanderson, suffers from amnesia caused by the accidental death of his uh, partner. In his quest to recover, both his memories and his lost love, he receives letters he wrote to himself as the first Eric Sanderson. The letters explain that his amnesia is caused by a cryptozoological creature called the Ludovician, uh, which is a conceptual shark 
that lives in the sphere of embodied textual inscription. Constituted by typographical imagery, the Ludovician is a posthuman subject embodied in words, through which it is becoming a physical entity. I don't know, I quote, I don't know exactly how the thought fish came to be in the world, writes the first Eric Sanderson to the second. But in the wide, warm pools of society and culture, millions of words and ideas and concepts are constantly evolving. To recover his past, Eric must enter the world, the world of the conceptual shark, and he must drink the concept of water from a glass full of thin paper strips, each of which has the word water painted, uh, printed on it in black ink. Uh, so when Eric drinks it, it's literally drinking words. These words literally turn into water, which shows that concepts, I quote from Barat now, concepts and things do not have determinate boundaries. Is Barat right? Uh, this novel seems to demonstrate that. So Eric says, uh, I quote, the paper and the words were gone. Now there was water real physical water where the world had been. Okay, uh, no, I'm not there. The Raw Shark Texts explores the material embodiment of language which stands out as an effective presence contesting literally and figuratively the boundaries between the textual and the material and producing a matrix where the discursive uh, event turns into a material one. This novel foregrounds textuality as an essential substrate for materiality, which itself uh, unfolds, I, I quote from Catherine Hales, through dynamic interactions uh, between physical characteristics and signifying strategies, end quote. More astonishing than these examples, however, are some forgotten 18th century English novels that feature speaking objects as narrative agencies. These objects, uh, disclose secrets about their human possessors and the social context in which they move. Uh, they, uh, Latour would have called them full-fledged actors uh, because um, they speak in a world of multiple interacting processes, such as systems of production and uh, consumption of uh, an emerging capitalism in the 18th century. So these are uh, the novels uh, that are not uh, republished, unfortunately. The Adventures of a Watch, however, you can get them in the archives. Um, Adventures of a Hackney Coach, Adventures of a Banknote, Adventures of a Corkscrew, Adventures of a Black Coat, Crystal or the Adventures of a Guinea, The Adventures of a Rupee, wherein an inters uh, interspersed various anecdotes, Asiatic and European. Um, these novels show matter in its ability to make things happen, to produce effects, as uh, Jane Bennett would have said. Talking and gossiping pins, coaches, coats, snuff boxes, banknotes, coins, ladies' slippers, hackney caps, walking canes, and wigs in these novels are personified in order to confer agency and intent upon an otherwise allegedly passive and inert, inert um, world. And uh, these objects narrate their stories that are intimately bound up with the stories of the, their human uh, uh, possessors, owners. In the adventures um, of a watch, the watch here announces itself as a watch of quality and says that it may surely be allowed to feel as well as a dog, dog of quality. Humanity is the darling characteristics of a free and enlightened people and should extend to every quarter of globe, says the watch. And even though the watch says also, now in all probability, there may be some difference between organisms of the human frame and the mechanism of a watch, its story reveals intimate connections between humans and material agencies. This is more visible uh, in the non-human uh, narrator of the adventures of a corkscrew who helps orphan children and feels some joy akin, akin to human sentiment. And uh, the corkscrew says, I felt a joy superior to what I, have ever, I, um, I had ever before experienced, he proclaims, 
say ye all libertines, ye gamblers and others, did you but know the superlative felicity, a good action of words? You, uh, he, he says, you who would quit your favorite sport for proper objects to exercise your benevolence upon? Many narrative agencies in these uh, forlorn 18th century novels have transformative power and participate in the co-creation of cultural meanings when they move across uh, public and private spheres. And uh, the last example is from The Adventures of a Pin. Here, uh, the pin is enclosed in a box and is engaged in a deep conversation with the other pins. Our conversation, as we went along, shut up in the box, may not be unpleasing to the reader, especially when he reflects how seldom he may have an opportunity of hearing two pins hold conversation. And if any part of my history has hitherto afforded him any pleasure, I beseech him likewise to give attention to our conversation. The pen also raises questions about humanity's limited capacity to understand the animate world around. The pen says the general ideas which mankind form of places, persons, and things prove very often vague, and on examination they find the real pictures widely different from the imaginary one the mind had depicted. Um, these uh, fictional narratives uh, actually generate uh, a vicarious knowledge about storied matter. They are important uh, facets of material imagination to help reshape our cultural values and perceptions about the physical world. So the question here is, uh, would our ethical visions change if we heed the messages given by inanimate objects in these novels? We will talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, Ultimately, we can say um, the answers, we may now think, get back to questions of values and perceptions. Since storied matter interacts with earthly life via social practices and with human stories that emerge from them, it invites us to reflect on environmental and social justice in the tangles of material agencies and human responsibilities. Finally, matters, stories matter because they tell us just how totally meaningless the human non-human boundaries are. If this is not convincing enough, uh, coming from a literary scholar, I'd like to quote the uh, famous astrophysicist Eric Chasson, who says that when we reflect back on matter, what we find is a natural history, a universal history, a rich and abiding story of our origins. That is something, nothing less than an epic of creation as understood by modern science, a coherent Weltgeschichte that people of all cultures can adopt as currently true as truth can be, end quote. Or better, I have an, another example. Let's listen to the poetic words of cosmologist Brian Swim. The great discovery of contemporary science, he says, is that the universe is not simply a place, but a story, a story in which we are immersed to which we belong, and out of which we arose. This story has the power to awaken us more deeply to who we are. Actually, when uh, we really do awaken, we will see that we don't necessarily understand the earth any better than telluric powers, uh, geological forces, or allegedly mute things would do. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>